faculty development program on Shalon Day Foundations. So during this uh, session, um, we will have a lecture by Professor Amar Madhav, uh, Emeritus Professor, um, IIT Hyderabad and distinguished uh, uh, Professor J. Into Hyderabad. He will, be he will be delivering a lecture on the topic of uh, new perspectives on uh, bearing capacity. Uh, I invite uh, Professor Ammar Madhav sir to deliver his lecture. Please, okay. Sir. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Let me first load it. Uh, can you see the presentation? Hello, can you see the presentation? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Okay. Now? Can you see now? No, sir. No, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Because I. Yeah, okay. I see on the screen, but uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Reddy. A very nice morning to all of you here. And today I'm going to present something which I hope will start making you think. And I would like you to comment at the end of my presentation whether what we have been doing all these years is continuing with the same mistake or wrong assumption. Just like, I don't know how many of you know, the computer, the, uh, what's called? like the typewriter keyboard, computer keyboard is exactly the same as that was designed for the typewriters in 1870. And the final version which we have been using was deliberately made to work slow. I think all of you know when they started designing the typewriter keyboard, the ovals were at the center what you find as GH, it used to be A and E because they're the most common letters people were using. And you also know that your first finger is much easier to activate rather than your leaky finger. So when the typewriter was designed with ovals at the center to be used with the first finger, the lever was getting jammed and the because people were typing so fast, typewriter used to get jammed. So in order to slow down the typing, in 1870, the typewriter keyboard was changed so that A and E and I and O were kept away from the center and you either had to use your little finger or your ring finger, whereas the letters which we don't use often, like J, H, are at the center with your first finger. Now, this is how it has been going on for the last maybe what's 110, 20 years. Then this computer came and initially they were only using as an adding machine, etc. So they adopted the same keyboard as the typewriter. But we don't have a mechanical device. Electronically, if you type, you can do much faster. But because people have been used to the typewriter keyboard, we are all stuck with this same keyboard on a, you can increase the speed of the processor, you are going into terabytes, I mean, so many, you know, terabytes per second or whatever it is, but we are using still a very slow keyboard. It's the same thing that's happened without bearing capacity. And so I wanted to quote here what Victor DiMello said in one of his lectures. 
the important thing in science is not so much to obtain new facts as to discover new ways of thinking about them. I want you to think of these because I can tell you bearing capacity is the bread and butter of most geotechnical engineers and that is the only parameter all my structural colleagues ask. Give them a value of 10 tons, 15 tons, 20 tons, they're very happy. Nobody knows whether it is the right one, is it the rational one, is it the appropriate one. And I'm also guilty because I've been teaching this subject as for the textbooks are concerned and the code, but I want you to now look at the history of how we ended up with this and what should we do in order to change our perspective. I expect the new generation, particularly of geotechnical engineers, will educate the structural engineers that bearing capacity of foundations is not what they think it is, but it is much more than what it should be. So I would like to start with saying that we have, I call it carrying capacity because I'm looking at shallow and deep foundations. Where a shallow foundations for things we call bearing capacity. For pile capacity, we just say carrying capacity. So I use the same word. And if you look at history or the way you have been teaching, it is purely based on the strength. Kasagi looked at the strength of the soil and then said, okay, let me calculate bearing capacity. But since around 1960s, we have been also realizing the bearing capacity or whatever we should do should be based on compressibility also because ground and soil are deformable materials, not rigid plastic materials. And this is what I am going to emphasize that we should also look at it. Then it also, it can be, you can prove that you can calculate the limiting capacity based on stiffness alone. It's a phenomenon very similar to buckling. The reason why I'm talking about it is, again, we have ignored the structure completely. We only consider a footing and the ground. Nowhere you will find a footing and ground, you will have a structure above. And so we should look at structure, ground, foundation together. And we should do that for tall structures. There is another failure possibility criterion. I call it as a leaning instability in geotechnical engineering. In structural engineering, you call it as buckling. Lastly, I would like to say, instead of depending on the strength parameters determined determine in the laboratory. I think most of us know our commercial labs are very poor quality. They cannot take a good undisturbed sample. They take some sample. Many times I find re they reconstitute the sample. They take the soil from the field, particularly if it's a granular material, put it in a shear box and come with some C and five values. What I would like you to do would be try to depend on a more carefully conducted in situ test, like standard penetration test, which again, unfortunately, is something we all depend on. But I would prefer if you can get the cone penetration test and use those values. So if you do that, you will be able to predict the bearing capacity or allowable capacity better. Historically, this is one of the earliest failures of a structure which happened in Canada, as you can see, October 18th, 1913. The foundation went inside to a depth of something like 24 feet on one side and tilted. So then they said, oh, maybe the reason is there is a possible sliding surface and they identified or guessed at that say, they found a, they put in a borehole and they found how the soil got affected away from the foundation, away from the silo, and they postulated this uh, failure. And this they call as bearing capacity. But again, I want you to realize it has tilted. So for all you know, it might have failed by tilting and then collapsed later. So based on that, we come with the concept that structures 
may fail in bearing capacity if it's not adequate enough. And so we use that for both shallow and deep foundations. Here I just showed you a lat-loaded pile. And again, if you treat it as a rigid one, short rigid pile, you expect it to rotate about some point and you calculate the pressures. And if I have a shallow foundation, even though it may tilt and rotate, we only look at it as if it is predominantly going vertical. The history of the whole thing was because when Tazagi wrote his book, Theoretical Soil Mechanics, he simply divided geotechnical engineering problems into two categories, stability problems and elasticity problems. He never realized they're actually coupled. So he said, we look at stability problems and the second one would be deformable, uh, deformation problems or issues. But it's not that simple. In our case, I would like to show during my lecture that both are connected. There is nothing like independent one. And here again, I'd like to draw a parallel with our Newtonian mechanics, where space and time are separated by Isaac Newton. But it was Einstein in early 20th century, he said space and time are connected. So you will realize in our case, both stability and serviceability should be considered together. I want you to look at the stress strain curves of all the civil engineering materials. On the vertical axis, we have stress in megapascals. And on the horizontal axis, we have strain again in linear one. Steel, obviously, is the strongest material we use. The standard one is your 415 FE415, where the ultimate strength is about 415 megapascal. And of course, you know, E is uh, very high, 230 gigapascal. So if you look at the strain at failure, it is not even not 1%. So we call that as a rigid plastic material because till failure, there are hardly any deformation. Then we have the low yield strength. Other, of course, you have different steels. Now we go up to even 500 megapascals, etc. The FE250 is a low yield strength, but it picks up strength. And you may get, after strain softening and strain hardening, you get probably around 400 megapascals too. But even this steel is rigid plastic because you can see the deformation before yield of say 250 megapascal is negligible. So as far as steel is concerned, can we say it is a rigid plastic material which does not deform or it deforms insignificantly before it reaches failure or yield. Then I have M50, which is our typical concrete that you use for most structural elements. And M15 is a slightly weaker one. Can you identify where is our soil in this plot? You can see that all of those stress strain curves lie along the x-axis. Now, I want you to think, can I use a theory developed for high strength FE415 to a material which doesn't even figure in the stress strain curve? This is the most shocking way you can realize why we are doing a great disservice. So in order to, wait a minute, I think this is linear, okay. Okay, now I have stress on a log scale, but the strain is on linear scale. Now you can see the stresses in megapascal increasing from 0, 0, 001, which means it's something like 1 kPa, 10, uh, 1, I mean not 1, 0 0.1, 1, 10, etc. Now I can see the stress strain curves for our soils. The steel and concrete remain the same, but now you can see a dense sand can go up to strength depending on the confining stress up to maybe 500, 600 kilopascal. A loose sand is somewhat less. A stiff clay probably has strength of around maybe 100, 200 kPa. And soft clay is of the order of 10, 15 kPa. 
you can also see the stress strain curve and if i now look at the strain in the log scale do you realize now you can see the strain before failure in case of steel is not not one whereas in case of sands the strain is maybe 10 percent five percent which means we have a material which is highly deformable whose strength is very low compared to steel why do you keep harping on that because does that <laughs> Here you can see the values if you want. You can make out from the figure. You can see ultimate strengths in case of 415 steel is 415. The low yield one is 250. Concrete is 15. Pam 15. Dense sand is 1 to 2 megapascal. Loose sand is 0.3 to 1. Stiff clay is 0.1 to 0.2. Soft clay is not 1 to 05 megapascal. Look at the modulus of elasticity or deformation. In case of steel, 2 into 10 to the power of 5 megapascal. In case of concrete, is around 4, 1200, 4,000, 1200, etc. Whereas in case of sands and clay, it comes down to less than 100 megapascal. And maybe soft clay, maybe the order of hardly 2 to 20, 25. Strain at failure. In case of steel, is hardly not 2%. Whereas in our soft clay or loose sand, it is 10 to 15, 10 to 20%. Now, I want you to use your logic. Can I use a theory developed for steel, a rigid plastic material, to a very soft, weak material like sand, clay, etc.? Just think, and then let me know at the end of presentation, would you agree with this or not? The reason I'm saying is, Tezaghi is the one who propounded the theory of very capacity for shallow foundations later extended to. The first thing he did was, he said, there's no structure. I'm only looking at the footing. And then if the footing is at a certain depth, I replace the soil above the footing level with some you have gravity material only, so I have such charge. The reason Tezaghi did, I hope you know that if you read his biography, Tezaghi was a mechanical engineer. He was not a civil engineer. He studied mechanical engineering maybe in late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. And in mechanical engineering, Prankel came with a theory for pressing of metals. If you have a steel or cast iron ingot, you heat it and you press it down to make it into a sheet, a thin material, etc. So he came with the idea, Prankel, that if I do this, how will it get deformed? So the mechanism developed by Prankel was for steel. This is how it is. He said, apply the pressure through a rigid die. And so he said, there will be a wedge below the die, which we call as active zone. And then you have the radius shear zones and the passive zone. And the angles are given as alpha, which we convert because of angle of shearing resistance into, for the weight, it is 45 plus V by two. And for the passive weight, it is 45 minus V by two. Please remember, I want you to think of it all the time. This was tailored for steel. And obviously, Tezaghi, knew only this and he wasn't looking at and I don't blame him because in 1925 to 30 we hardly know anything about soil. We are very grateful to Tezaghi for his theory but doesn't mean that even after 100 years if I know it is not correct I should use the same. We are not stuck like computer or keyboard. We are not stuck with a typewriter keyboard but we it's all our own creation of the mechanism and use of the solutions. So Tezaghi then he said, oh, let's look at it. And then this is how we look at the details. First thing, as I said, he neglected the structure completely. And then he said, this is a rigid plastic material. And so we have the details of the failure mechanism. And then he originally suggested, in case the footing is rough, 
the weight will be only controlled by now by 45 plus 5 by 2 the active weight he said it may be controlled by the angle of shearing resistance of the material which will be 5 but people after testing realize this is not true and we have discarded this material in all our textbooks and the code then Mayerhoff came with his theory that why should we neglect the shear resistance of the soil above the footing level so we have what you can call as the Mayerhoff theory of bearing capacity which gives you some extension of the failure mechanism above the ground above the footing level so these are the usual bearing capacity factors we derive for various cases we have different ones mayor after zaghi then you have hansen with seek etc so basically it depends on how people use them then somewhere in 1960s basic conducted a series of tests Alexander Vesic at Georgia Tech, he said, let me look at it under various relative densities. So he first tested, then he found that it may not extend fully, which is realized by even Tezag and Peck, and they called it as a local shear failure. Then Vesic conducted on loose sands. Then he found out there is no failure mechanism developed at all. The footing keeps going inside, so he called it as a punching mechanism. You can see the weight slightly extending below. So as it goes deeper, obviously the resistance increases gradually. So we now are aware of from basic test that footings on ground can fail under three conditions, general shear failure, local shear failure and punching shear failure. These are the modes of failure which are identified. And we said that if it's general shear failure, the settlement before failure will be relatively small and there could be complete collapse because the, if you look at the plot on the right side, the bearing capacity or the carrying capacity of the foundation decreases with deformation. We also realize there's going to be some heaving outside the footing area. So the soil keeps moving. And whereas the second one, which is called the local shear failure, the failure mechanism is only developed or mobilized through the active wedge and the radius shear zone. There is very little heaving on either side of the footing. And you can see the curve asymptotically reaching the ultimate value. So if I have a curve of this kind, obviously there is no ultimate value I can pick up. I'll have to look at what is my deformation tolerance for the structure and give that value as the whatever allowable, safe, etc. So I want you to realize here for the first time that there is no prescribed ultimate maximum value. Things become even more critical or word if I have punching shear failure. You can see that, in fact, the bearing capacity increases with dis displacement. It continuously goes because once the footing is going deeper, maybe the surcharge effect or the densification because of our pushing the foundation into the ground increases the strength of the soil and you get a higher bearing capacity. So this is the kind of state of effect. And we have this standard uh, chart which tells you relative density versus the depth of the footing with respect to the width. General shear failure is only valid for shallow foundations, d by v less than 2 or something, and relative density greater than 75, 80%. I want you to tell me how many sites are we aware of where the sand is in a very relative density of the order of 80 to 100%. It rarely happens in nature. Most of the time, the soils are, whether it's relative density or medium stiff, I call very dense means very heavy stiff clay, I mean strong clay, medium clay and soft clay. So I would like you to convert these into our low, I mean, low, low relative density, medium, etc. If relative density is the order of something like 35 to 70, and you have shallow to intermediate depths of D by V, 3, 4, etc. you'll probably get shear failure. This is according to Vesic. 
which is of course adopted too. And Vesic did all his tests in a tank, which is about one meter cube or one and a half meter cube. And all his tests were based on a footing of the order of something like 20 to 30 centimeters in diameter. And instantly, while he was using pouring of sand to get to test this different one, for general shear failure, he had to vibrate the sand to get very high relative density. But what you find is in case of loose sand, which means relative density less than 35%, you don't get either of these. You'll get punching shear failure. Punching shear failure means continuous deformation with no clear failure at all. And this is how many of the tests on ground show that if I have relative density or dry density less than 85 or relative density less than 35, the strain at failure is 15 to 20, 25%. For local shear failure, the strain at failure can be 10 to maybe something like 5%. And even for general shear failure, the strain at failure is the order of something like maybe 5%. So if I have a footing, let's say, but these are all tests done on small scale plate. The maximum you can see is about eight inches, which is about 18 to 2.5 to 200 mm in diameter. Imagine if I have a two meter diameter footing, if I say 5% of it, how much will be the displacement? Do we allow that? So are we trying to use the same concept in our real life? Then, of course, some people have done some analysis in terms of uh, smooth and rough footing, in terms of surcharge, Poisson's ratio effect. And you find that the these are all numerically simulated results, including the dilation angle. That new, you see, is dilation angle. If I have a dense sand or even medium dense sand, it may dilate. So if it is dilating, you will get a different bearing capacity, as you can see, compared to a soil which doesn't dilate. And you can see even here that the load displacement diagrams are not very clear, except for one of cases where the failure is clear. Otherwise, you need large displacements. And the normalized sediment delta by B is the order of something like 5% for failure, or it can go up to 10 to 20% in case of these high surcharge one. So you realize that in real life, you don't expect this kind of behavior. Again, these are effects of footing, roughness, and dilation. And you can see how much difference you can get. Normalized bearing capacity in terms of N gamma can vary from something like 3.5 to 4 for a smooth footing to a rough footing, which goes up to 6 to 7, that is N gamma, normalized value. I want you to now switch your thinking to a very different concept. This was a pressure meter developed in 1960s by Menard. What he says is if I introduce a cylindrical probe into the ground, I expand it by putting pressure, the probe expands laterally and it causes failure. So this was a pressure meter developed and they were using it. Then people tried to develop the theory for this. So they said, if I have a pressure meter, instantly we don't look at the ends because we put a guard cell, only the measuring cell, which is in the center, which is axis symmetry. When I look at the mechanics of it, I will have the pressure cell, then I have a plastic zone, elastoplastic zone, and then finally the soil, which is probably in the elastic region. I want you to look at the top equation. The limit pressure under pressure meter is called PL is given as CU into NC star plus sigma H. Can you identify that this is exactly the same or very similar to bearing capacity of footing on clays? We say QU is CU NC into Q naught, which is the surcharge. Now, instead of surcharge, I have sigma H, which is the lateral pressure around the pressure meter. Cu is the undrained strength of the soil. Now look at Nc. Nc is given as earlier 5.14 for a strip and 6.14 or so for axisymmetrical because we use a shape factor of 1.2. 
when I look at NC star now, it is equal to 1 plus natural log of G by Cu. What is G? G is the shear modulus of the soil. So for once now we have limit pressure, which is exactly same or very similar to bearing capacity, doesn't depend on this strength alone. The behavior is now governed by the deformation parameter called the shear modulus G. So we see, he realized that you can use the concept of cavity. He said, let me look at the soil between the foundation and the uh, ground as a cavity and I increase the pressure, I exactly get the same as the bearing capacity failure. So we call it as a cavity expansion theory and he came out with these pressures. For originally, the limit pressure for clay was given by Gibson and Anderson in 1964 and it was very the first time when I was doing my PhD, I saw this. And I was glad that finally it has been developed somewhere in 70s and it has come up in some textbooks and few uh, codes also. So what Vesic did was he extended the theory of Gibson and Anderson to C5 soil. So he put limit pressure is C prime into FC prime and sigma H, which is lateral pressure into FQ. Basically the undrained strength parameter and the such charge effective. I want you to realize that most of these parameters depend on what you call it IR, the rigidity index, which is nothing but G by C plus sigma H into tan phi, etc. And then there's also a volume change parameter where you have how much dilation is likely to occur in the soil. So if I now look at this basic theory and I now plot here, let me see, can you see the, I want to remove this. Okay, the x-axis G by Cu, which means if I have the ratio of shear stiffness, which you do, you can do by the traction. If I have a saturated soil, G is equal to E by 2 into 1 plus nu. Nu is 0.5 for a saturated undrained condition. I can get the shear modulus. If shear modulus increases, you can see the limit pressure increasing. And of course, depends on the horizontal confining stress by Cu. What you realize is it can vary from as low as four or five for low G by Cu values to as high as 10, nine, etc. for very stiff soil, which means G by Cu ratio is a order of thousand. For once you now realize that G by Cu is a very important parameter. What it does it mean? G is the shear stiffness, which is like our E, deformation modulus. Both are related by simple Poisson's ratio. And so the limit pressure or whatever it is, is controlled. So if I now take it as a ratio, if I have very, very stiff soil, a very dense soil, then if I say the rigid plastic theory is valid, then the ratio is equal to one. But if G by gamma into D, gamma is unit weight, D is the diameter of the plate. And for different friction angles, if I calculate this using same basic theory, the ratio can vary from as low as 0 0.5, 5, 5, it can go. So which means only in case of very stiff soils, very dense soils, I get the full bearing capacity. But what is more important is at different levels of G by gamma W, gamma D, you can calculate what should be the ratio of RQ and then how much reduction we can do from the general shape failure. So we don't have to depend on the Zagipex empirical one, two thirds C and two thirds tan phi and say it is local shear failure. Now you have a complete spectrum which you can use to calculate the bearing capacity as a function of a deformation or compressibility parameter G. Then we looked at the basic theory now, which has given. We know all these usual factors due to shape, depth, etc. Vesic came out with the compressibility factor, IR. IR is nothing but shear modulus by C plus Q tan phi. Q is your stress below the footing. 
at a depth of something like V by 2. So I can calculate IR. And IRR is actually the limiting value, which is for infinite or very large rigid footing. So now we have FCC. The term, we multiply the cohesion term, compressive due to compressibility. FQC, the such as term is multiplied by FQC and the gamma B term is multiplied by F gamma C. So we have now using the same IR, which is nothing but G by C plus Q tan phi. If phi is zero, it's G by C, which is what we have seen for the first curve in this. So, so here, these parameters are all given, FC, FQ, et cetera, based on cavity expansion theory. And you can see how FC varies as a function of angular shearing resistance. If I have a low value, and if the IR value is low, you can see the FQ value is in the order of 2 to 3. But if IR, the risk index is 500, the FQ increases from something like 7 to maybe 30 or 40 by the time angular shear resistance increases to 40, etc. Similarly, you can see FC as a function of angular shear resistance, but different relative stiffnesses. I use IR, but IR is nothing but relative stiffness. It is G by some strength parameter like Cu plus sigma, sigma H tan phi. So please look at it. Bearing capacity is no more a function of strength alone, but it's a function of strength and deformation properties. So we are trying to calculate how much reduction in bearing capacity should I do? So here is a chart, G by gamma D. G is the shear modulus. Gamma into D is the depth of it. And RQ is your bearing capacity reduction factor for different values of C by gamma D, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.52. I want you to look at if C by gamma D is 1, 1 1.5, et cetera, the reduction factor goes down to maybe something like 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. That means 30% of the bearing capacity due to rigid plastic theory only is available. So if you are using Tazagi's bearing capacity theory or one of those uh, Meerhoff or Hansen, all of them are based on rigid plasticity. And if you still believe soil is a rigid plastic material, hard luck. I would say we are putting your head in the ground and not seeing reality. What I want you to now switch is that treat soil as a deformable solid, highly deformable soil. So we are trying to find out for these uh, different parameters, how much it can vary. So only in case of very stiff material, I can get good value. But if I have changes, I can get low value, half, etc. This is again QU by QU for a rigid or rigid plastic material with variation with rigid index and phi for a strip footing. B by L is zero, which means B L is infinity, and C by gamma B, that means a purely granular material. D by B one means a footing whose depth is equal to B. Please note that the bearing capacity, how it varies with IR. In this case, even with phi is equal to 45, particularly with easy phi is equal to 45, a highly deformable ground will give you bearing capacity less than even 10%. So it doesn't mean anything that I say I calculate bearing capacity for a stiff ground based on this kind of data. The values can be very, very low. So please note that no more are we justified in using Tezagi's bearing capacity theory who studied under Prantel or who studied Prantel mechanism, which is developed for steel, and steel is a rigid plastic material. Soil and ground are highly deformable materials whose strength is low, whose stiffness is even one ten thousand less than that of steel. So it's only we get strength when soil deforms. This is for Q by Q or SIR. Now for, as a function of C by gamma B, which means again normalizing cohesion with the unit weight and width of the foundation for a strip. And you can again see the bearing capacity can reduce to less than 10% for highly deformable ground or IR values less than 10. So we have 
it becomes only rigid plastic when IR is greater than something like 70, 80, or 90, when the value becomes one. So we have all these calculations you can do using basic cavity expansion theory, or you develop your own set of chart so that when you want to predict, please use, don't only use CN5, go for, I want the shear stiffness, get the values of shear modulus or deformation modulus convert into. We found in this case that uh, for stiff foundation, these values are all independent for Basically, C by gamma B has very little influence, but still the range is from as low as 10%. And if you go for IR greater than 100, only then you will get digital plastic solution where the deformations are less than maybe 1% or so or strains at failure. This is for V is equal to 45 degrees, in which case it doesn't matter. It's a C5 soil, but you don't have a C5 soil with phi greater than or 45. So this is not of importance. This is for against the foundation, for different depths of the foundation, D by V varying from 0.5 to 3. Again, it seems to be the ratio of Q U by QR, which means the ultimate bearing capacity predicted using cavity expansion theory, which means ultimate bearing capacity of a deformable ground to that of a rigid plastic ground is not sensitive to the depth of the foundation. This is B by L is equal to one, which means a square footing, depth of the footing is equal to width of the footing. And again, you got similar plots. You can generate all of them. The idea of all of them is to illustrate to you that the rigid plastic theory is not valid at all. We don't have that kind of soil anywhere in the world, which is highly strong and stiff. Most of the soils we deal with are maybe medium relative density or even low relative density. You hardly will get a sand or a very stiff clay where I can use rigid plasticity theory. So these are all the different charts. This is the effect of B by L. For stiff footing, it's the worst scale, B by L zero. The ratio is very, very low. And for a square footing, it's slightly better. So in all these plots, the x-axis in rigidity index or relative stiffness parameter. So basically what you need to do would be to calculate the bearing capacity as a function of relative stiffness. Now, this will also affect your piles because you're doing with cone penetration test, let's say. This is very similar to how pine, pine, what is that? pile penetration also. So when I have a cone, I mention the tip resistance. And please note that piles are all deep foundations, which means the depth of the foundation or the footing or depth of the tip with respect to the width of the the diameter is very, very high. Could be 50, 100, et cetera. So you will end up getting highly deformation or punching kind of failure. So we said, what do we do in case of tip resistance? And you can see even here, it's very, very significant in the sense that even for a highly rigid material because of punching, the tip resistance is, can be less than what you predict using rigid plasticity theory. So when you design this pile foundation, you need to consider what should be the strength parameters or what should be the base resistance, particularly because the base is at a great depth, which means I should not use any of these standard formulae, which will depend only on the strength parameters. Please note that, that once you have the tip resistance, even the shaft resistance is affected, but we don't look at it that seriously. So when I look at the tip resistance, I normally take this average from the tip, get the N values or QC values, about five to eight diameters above and maybe four to five diameters below and do that. But even after that, I need to worry about the type of failure that I expect. Should I use rigid plasticity theory or should I use the 
deformation, what you call cavity expansion kind of thing. I just have a very interesting chart, which even for the shaft, Schmettmann way back in 78, and based on his student Nottingham too, gave as a function of L by D. So more deeper it is, even the shaft resistance parameter alpha decreases, which means the effect of depth is reflected in all our calculations. I'm not saying now even, this is not dependent on cavity expansion. Based on his experience and interpretation of load test, he came out saying that for timber pile, steel pile, and concrete pile, and you will see with L by D increasing, alpha decreases. So it means that depth effect is coming, which means the volume change effect. So when I look at this actual capacity, these are the formula we use, which are dependent purely on strength, but you need to revise them using compressibility parameter. So you have to use basic cavity expansion theory. Then we are also trying to extend the same, that if everything depends on deformation, shouldn't we look at the even lateral loaded pile? Because if you look at the lateral loaded pile, the deformations are very important. A pile which is loaded laterally behaves like a beam and it's not a column. A beam deflects much more than a column because of flexion or bending. And then most of the time, the deflection at the footing level is very important. And even if you fix it at the bottom, the deformation at the top is very, very significant. So we need to look at the kinematics. And we have different types of uh, mechanisms for a free head short pile, fixed head short pile. The Free head one can rotate about some point, whereas if the pile is fixed in the pile cap, it can only translate. So then we say this is how they rotate, and then the pressures are mobilized in case of sand. We say it's pushing towards the soil, so maybe it's going into passive case. And then Broms and Hansen have recommended the three times the three to four times, even five times the passive pressure because of three-dimensional effect. And these are all charts available in our books and code. Brahms gave in 1964, but I want you to again revise this. Brahms worked in, published his paper in 1964, and his work is probably based around 61, 62, and he worked in Scandinavia, Sweden, where some of the soils are extremely soft, near the ground. So he said, neglect the top 1.5 diameter, whereas Ola Slater and then his uh, another colleague, MacDonald, they said, no, you should not neglect the strength of the soil, particularly because we're not putting piles at the ground level, we're putting at the pile cap, which is below the pile cap, and so we had to look at it. So they said, don't ignore the strength of the soil in the top 1.5 times the diameter of the pile, but you can say that at the top, the minimum value at ground level will be 2 CU because you're under strength, on confined constraint compressive strength. And then at 3D, it becomes equal to 9 CU, which is the maximum value. And so we have these stress diagrams based on which we calculate ultimate capacity. So for sands and clay, and then we also need to worry about, because it's a deformable material, we cannot use only one initial tangent modulus. We need to look at the PY curves and take the secant modulus based on what should be the value of the stress displacement slope at different deformations. So the secant modulus comes. And then, so we said, why not we look at it as a curve, as a hyperbola, this actually, one of our colleagues, Professor Padmavati here, she did quite a bit of it too. So we fitted a hyperbola where KS is, of course, initial tangent model. The whole curve is treated as hyperbola. You can see that PY curve, which looks like a hyperbola, initially very steep. As you extend the or increase the load, it becomes very flat, reaches the ultimate value hyperbolically. So we fitted this kind of curve and did all the analysis. We also said in case of sand, the case stiffness increases with depth. It could be non-linear, but the best way to do would be fit a linear one. So we said case is equal to NH into Z, which means linear increase from the top as you go down to the base. So we have the rate of increase of 
subgrade modulus are quotient to subgrade reaction, increasing with depth linearly, and because you normalize with respect to D, diameter of the pile becomes easy. So we can analyze in case of clay, constant value, or in case of sand, a linear increase too. Using based on the, now I find that I can plot what will be the normalized load as a function of displacement for different values of mu. You have seen the definition of mu is initial tangent modulus into length by Q max. So you can see based on the value of Q, there's no defined failure now, even for, for lateral order pile. It's a function of normalized displacement, which is nothing but display, uh, displacement di by diameter. So you can see for different values of mu, which is your stiffness, you can get different load displacement graphs. How can I define any unique value for this? So now you realize that even the plant loaded pile, I had to decide on the allowable load based on the amount of displacement we Permit. Usually our code says five millimeter. So depending on the diameter, you can do that too. So we then were trying to compare. Even if I extend the curve and determine the ultimate load, that is where I get HU, I normalize with KP into gamma DQ, which is KP is passive coefficient, gamma unit weight DQ, it becomes normalized. And I'm plotting with respect to L by T. You can see that Bronx is over predicting significantly, whereas if I look at even the so-called extended ultimate value is much less than what Bronx has done. It's a function of mu. If mu is very high, then obviously it's a rigid plastic tends towards Bronx, but if mu is small, you get much less lateral capacity. And then we are also looking at Bronx has taken three times Kp as a limit, but others have recommended, both Pulas and McDonald, et cetera. You can even go for five. So we said, what happens? So it looks like if I increase the lateral pressure, ultimate lateral pressure more than Brahms, I get a higher value in terms of the capacity. So we then, after doing all this analysis, we looked at various load tests that are available. And you can see in this chart, the predictions. One is by Prasad and Chari at Newfoundland in Canada. Zhang was in China. The three is what actually was measured, those points. Then we said five value, which they have reported based on small scale load test. When you do the test in the laboratory on a small one, one scale, I'm sorry, one G model, most of the tanks are one meter by one meter and the stresses are very low. And you know the strength envelope is highly nonlinear. So we had to revise the given value. And then we use the revised value and predict it. And you can see curve five is much closer to the measured values. This is based on Adams and Radhakrishna tests on piles, which are load tested. And this is how the pressures vary too. One is Prasad and Chari gave a linear one, which doesn't hold good. They said, you know, up to about four or five, it's linear and changes the point of rotation. And you can see again, the three for four and measured values match very well. So basically what we were trying to show was that if you look at the nonlinearity, it works well. And so here again, we compared all the ultimate values for lateral order pile in clays with bronze, McDonald for very little eccentricity is zero. You see that ultimate lateral capacity by Cu into D square is a function of relative stiffness mu, Ks by the ultimate capacity of the pile. And Brom's value is very much on the higher side. McDonald also is on the higher side. So you need to look at the deformation characteristics. We got some load test data from Beshwin and others in 1981. And we could also see how our values are somewhat or reasonably better than what Brahms has predicted. Brahms predicts simply 9 CU. It doesn't hold good. 
the strength mobilization is very limited, so you get that value. These are some more tests where they're measured, and you can see that Brahms and McDonald, those results, I mean, those predictions don't match compared to the kinematics we considered and the hyperbolic relation we were using. Then I want to show you very interesting cases we have done recently. This is one of those very silly failure. There was a culvert for which return walls were built. Can you see the return wall was failing compared to the culvert? The reason is the culvert is designed as a very strong foundation. Return wall is not loaded, so they put a very simple shallow foundation. It failed. Similar to what happened in case of the Tower of Pisa. Now, the return wall is a very slender one, hardly maybe let's say 0.5 to 0.6 meters in thickness, and the height may be 4 or 5 meters, etc. I want you to look at the Tower of Pisa too. I think most of you know the history. It was started in 1180, was built in stages depending on the economics of the city of Pisa, and it went on being built. Finally, in 1990, the tower reached a limiting tilt of 5 degrees 34 minutes, and the deviation from the verticality, the horizontal displacement h, is around 4.3 meters. So the tilt was very high. This is, I think, value we got from year 1993. And then that's when they closed this uh, Tower of Pisa and asked some people to, including famous geotechnical engineers, Carl Vigiani, John Burland, and uh, Mike Yamkowski. Those three worked on and they came with a fantastic solution of controlled excavation in order to rectify partially by only half a degree. So this is how the history of the inclination, it keeps rotation increases on the south side over a period of long as the height of the tower increases. As you can see, the year 1278, 1360, construction was completed around that time. Then 1817 is probably the first recent measurement. And of course, 1890 was the other one. So the rate of tweak they found was four to six seconds per year. This is how you do the recent past. That is, in the 20th century, they were able to measure with more electronic devices, and we have this. What I want to say is that we have a lot of structures which are very tall. You know, if you think Tower of Pisa is high, you find that Buj Dubai is the one now that's more than 800 meters. Maybe in your career, you end up with structures which are one kilometer tall in Saudi Arabia or Japan, wherever you find that. We have a lot of these tall structures now. These are some of the ones in India. This is in Dubai. Lahore. Ho Chi Minh City, even Vietnam, we have very good towers coming up too. Hong Kong, of course, has many of them. What I want you to look at is, if I have a tall structure on compressible ground, I would like to suggest a simple experiment for all of you to do at home. If you have heavy textbooks or novels, let's say about five, 10. I know nowadays all my young students don't believe in reading any hard copy. They will read only the soft copies on the computer. But if you can get about five to 10 of them, stack them on your table, which is hard, rigid, wooden table, you can stack them vertically. Put a pillow or put the same books on your bed and tell me whether you can stack them one over the other or are they likely to tilt. This is exactly what happens if you have a tall structure. So you find that this soft ground will set it, maybe differentially it will tilt. I can show another example would be, take your dot pen refill hold it with your two fingers and press it, it will buckle exactly like the one on the right. So this is what could happen. So we said, why not look at it as a buckling phenomenon? And then of course, if it is going to deform with time, it will be creep also. So we call that as a leaning instability. We can do a simple 
analysis like Buckley, and you find that the limiting height HE into the average sediment WE divided by RE with square of RE, which is the radius of gyration, is equal to one. And how do I get the average sediment? I know the total weight of the structure divided by area, I get the total st average stress divided by modulus of subgrade reaction for the foundation, and I get KS, so I get average sediment. So the limiting, the criterion for instability is the moment HE into WE by RE square. RE is nothing but moment of inertia by area, square root of that. So you can easily get the radius of gyration. If it is one, it's going to fail. And you'd be surprised how it happens. So in order to verify this, one of my students did some simple experiment. He took a simple footing. He put a load directly on that and found out what will be the maximum load it can carry. Then he put a small block H, which is less than B, but he still did the experiment. The weight of the block is not important because the load is much higher. Then he took a very tall block, very thick block, and put the load. Can you believe it? PU1 with no block, no height of the building, is more than PU2, which is intermediate height of the block, and greater than PU3, which is a tall block or height which means here I have done the test with the height of the structure. I told you in the beginning, Tazagi never looked at the structure at all. So if you now look at it and the taller the structure, the more unstable it becomes. And the kind of failure that I want you to visualize is what I call as a leaning instability. So we calculated this for Tower of Pisa with whatever data we have. The height of the center of gravity is 18 meters. Average segment is 1.33. Radius of foundation is 10 meters. We calculated the radius of gyration, 5 meters. If you do that, it's very close to 0.96. So which means it's about to collapse. Incidentally, Italy had probably some 20, 30 towers because it was fashion in 12th, 13th century for every city to have a tower like what we have Kutub Minar, and you would see Kutub Minar was fortunately still there, but it has tilted. All other towers, except one more other than Pisa, that's stable, all others have failed for the simple reason the height is very high and the leaning instability is more critical. So this you can easily do that. So we then also extended this to a reasonable study of unloading. What happens when it tilts? One side of the foundation goes into compression. The other side is unloaded. Now, would you say the modulus or the stiffness is the same in compression compared to that in unloading? You can see KC compression, particularly with increasing load, becomes flatter. Unloading is relatively stiff. So because of that, we'll have a lot of problems in terms of uh, load settlement. So as we increase the height of the structure, you can see the load decreasing. This is what we did with the local seat, and these are the load displacement diagrams. Rotation, again, you can see the thicker the block, the more the rotation. This will illustrate to you that rotation is as important as leaning instability. So with the height of the model, ultimate load is decreasing. We had only limited study, so I don't say we can extend it, but theory is valid. We did exactly the same thing with local sands, and you can see again, load displacement relations for a tall structure is very high compared to foundation alone. These are the rotations. So then I looked at the data given by, it's a ranking lecture by Professor Port from Imperial College. He looked at the leaning instability of tall structures. He took a tall, say, cylindrical tower. Base diameter is 20 meters, the height is 60 meters. And then the used the typical undrained strength of 80 kPa. I want you to look at the rotation versus the weight of the tower. 
for different G by SU, if I have G by SU 1000, which is a rigid plastic material, the tower can take maybe something like maybe 130 mega newtons and very little rotation before failure. If G by SU is 100, you can see the ultimate load has decreased to 110, 115, but the rotation has increased significantly. If G by SU is 10, a very soft material, strength is the same, but stiffness has come down. The total load the tower can take has come down to 60 mega newtons, and it fails or rotation increases the moment the height of the or the weight of the tower increases beyond 50 mega newtons. This will tell you how the compressibility affects the rotation. So if I have a tall structure on a soft ground, it's going to fail by tilting and failing. It is no more a bearing capacity failure, please remember. So the taller the structure, the stiffer the ground has to be. So those of you who heard Professor Pula's lecture last month in the D Foundation Institute, he said that for the Burj Dubai Tower, Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai, even though they had good limestone, they had used piles, a large number of them, going to lengths of the order of 70 to 80 meters into the limestone, so that the sediments of the whole tower are reduced to less than 65 millimeters. So what they did was, it's a very tall structure, but the ground was made very stiff. So G by SU values in that case are more, probably closer to 1000. If they didn't use piles, it would have been maybe closer to 100. So Butch Dubai, if it is standing, is because the foundation is made stiffer. If any of you are interested, if you have an overhead water tank, please look at the tilting based on the kind of water load they have and the capacity. You will realize that some of the water tanks, which we studied at IIT Kanpur, do tilt by about half to one degree. So when we said, how about looking at another very important aspect, when the building rotates, you will have more compression on one side and probably heaving or unloading another. So we'll try to look at what happens to movement rotation relationships for ground foundations on inelastic ground. The reason I say inelastic because soils are not elastic material. Please remember, this is another fundamental mistake we do in all our analysis that the stress displacement graph is the same in compression as in unloading. So if I do that, I get a function which is a ratio K unloading by K compression. And if I do the analysis, this is what I'm looking at. Load unload response, K under loading is one value, K unloading is much higher. So if I, for different values, if I do the analysis, I found very strange results are very interesting. Even the point of rotation keeps varying depending on the value of RK. For a circular footing is one. If it is elastic, it should have been 0.5, which is at the this value at the left hand corner. Whereas for as you increase the ratio, K unloading by K compression, the point of rotation moves away from the center. This is for using, actually we went in for a continuum approach instead of using a Winkler model. And we find that X naught keeps varying for circle and different albi ratios too. And this is how the rotation changes. On the x-axis, I have Rk, which is equal to Ku by Kc, and the rotation. So if you're predicting based on assuming elastic one, you will have very high value. And if you have for different ones, you find different parameters coming. So we normalize all of them. But this is for a ring foundation, because most of the overhead water tank we have annular or ring foundation. So we try to calculate how much it will be. So you can see the rotation is a function of the relative stiffness to un unloading to compression. The critical value is a function of RK gain. And you can see as the ratio increases, the critical value of I theta 
is decreasing significantly. This is for a continuing shift footing, rectangular footing using continuous. We also studied the effect of embedment. Basically, what we see here is how you inelastic also makes a big difference. This is rotation values for circular footing. It's a little more complicated to calculate. So when I calculate for inelastic material with respect to a elastic material, elastic material all predicts it. And so we say we shouldn't use that at all. Then I would finally like to come back and say, if possible, try to use your institute tests and not C and F, etc. Use standard penetration or cone penetration. If you're fortunate to have a dilator meter or pressure meter, it's even better. So when I use the cone penetration, I get my tip resistance and shaft resistance. And if I have standard penetration, I take the N values corresponding to the second and third increments, that is penetration from 150 to 300 and 300 to 450, you get the N value. And we already have this Tezagi PEC chart, which give you the allowable pressure for 25 millimeter settlement. What does it mean? It means it's only valid for a given settlement and nothing to do with the ultimate value. It depends on the width of the footing and of course, SPT number. But if you look at the observed versus measured predicted, our predictions are very high, which means we are very, very conservative. We are all predicting it. And the sad part in India is 90 to 95 percent of our so-called consultants, structural engineers, don't bother to measure the settlements. In India, I hope someday you all encourage measuring settlements so that you know what is happening. So Mayor Hoff measured and found out that the Zagis is so conservative, he said, let's increase by at least 50 percent, 25 to 50 percent, and his predicted ratios now turn out to be anywhere from, say, I think 0.7 to 2, 3. So the range is still very high, but at least you are better than Tazagi. Peck and Bazara came with another modification based on SPTN. But I would rather like to, you to think in terms of Schmettmann's method, who originally in 1971, modified it in 1978 with his work. He uses what they call a strain influence factor, wherein I can calculate the strains at different depths and calculate the settlement based on this simple equation, where settlement is equal to C1 is one coefficient, C2 one is for the embedment, second is time, the net increase, net bearing pressure, influence coefficient IZ, E value, and the thickness of the layer. E is modulus of deformation is given as 2.5 times the static cone resistance at that depth for a square or circular foundation, 3.5 for the stiff foundation. So I simply integrate, I get the settlements. And these are some more modifications in terms of strain influence factor. For circular footing is very different from that for a strip footing. And we know how to take those values. Berland and Busbridge in 1985 came based on SPT. Burbridge actually collected about 350 footing deformation. And based on that, they came with very simple expression settlement as a function of width of the footing in terms of n value and he looks at the zone of influence over which you had to consider that so this is another powerful method which gives you the settlements and here is our comparison probability of exceeding settlement which is done by Sokova. they said if you use any of these Schmertman and Berland method the chances of uh, exceeding 25 meters in the settlement are much less for most of the footing compared to Tazagi and Peck. So I would now recommend that you go for this Schmettmann method, which is based on static cone. But even if you have SPT, I can convert into static cone and get it. And Berland and Budbridge is based on SPT alone. So basically what we have covered now is that ultimate or allowable bearing capacity of foundations in or on drawn is not a function of strength alone, but it's a function of strength and stiffness of the ground. You cannot ignore the height of structure, particularly if you have tall structures. 
So you have a totally different mechanism, which I call as leaning instability. Then the stiffness of the ground and kinematics are relevant, particularly for lateral load piles. And finally, I would like to say, you try to you predict your allowable pressures, tell the structural engineer, I need the details of your structure, the kind of footing. And here again, let me tell you in the last maybe 10, 15 years, most of the structures have a draft or a mat foundation, and they're calculating allowable bearing pressure based on strength. If the raft is 20, 30 meters in width, what will be the failure zone? It goes another 20, 30 meters. And at 20, 30 meters, you don't get any soil. Maybe you'll end up getting rock. So raft foundation should be designed, mat foundation should be designed only on sediment criterion. So I would recommend that you get a good SPT or static cone values from there, which are more reliable and estimate settlement based on that. And then you come out with your design. So finally, I would like to say, I respect Azagi, he has been father of geotechnical engineering, but he's like Newton. We should go for a more modern theory where space and time are connected. So that's how I look at my practice. And I would like to now end my presentation with my belief there is life in the ground. It goes into the sea. It also, when stirred up, goes into the man who stirs it. So I want you to now look at the ground and then get involved and get inspiration in doing your geotechnical practice. Thank you very much. And I would love to you know, answer any questions or comments you have. I'll be very happy to respond to any of your queries. Professor Reddy? Uh, participants uh, are free to interact with uh, Professor Amra Mahabharata. We had a uh, very excellent uh, informative lecture. Uh, SAR has uh, critically analyzed whatever bearing capacity we are using. Particularly highlighted the importance of uh, stiffness of the ground. We cannot uh, 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 design our foundations uh, based on uh, strength conservations, strength and stiffness, right? Both are to be considered. Okay, somebody was asking, is there any reference for cavity expansion? Some of the recent books, unfortunately, we in India, we are only using recycled books which are with technical knowledge of 1960s. Please look at Advanced Oil Mechanics, Advanced Foundation Varying by Das, or any of those, or say American books, where you have this. I think uh, Salgado has a very good one. Uh, on foundation geotechnical engineering. I think Jean Louis Brio, BM Das, probably even both has. Unfortunately, none of the Indian authors, or very few of them, hardly ever do that. I want you to stop reading Aurora and uh, that kind of book. Unfortunately, 90% of the colleges seem to follow one of these uh, rice recycled books of 1960s. And people who wrote, again, after that, also use the same recycled material. None of these, which is valid from 1970 onwards, is not being used, whereas the rest of the world has been using it. So you have many books you can look for in the, nowadays, I know why that girl has asked. You want any information, go Google search, you will get it. Even basics paper, cavity expansion theory, all of them. They're all available on the net. So you update yourself and then share the knowledge with the student so that the practice will become better and modern, more rational and sensible. Okay, Aditi, you should look for the book. Now, would you, I want people to comment 
or we justified in using Kazakhis bearing capacity theory still, or should we revise our thinking? The main emphasis of my talk has been that rigid plasticity is not valid. Kazagi followed Prantel, which is for metals, steel, should not be used for soft material like soil and the ground. Sir, good morning, sir. Yeah. Sir, this is uh, Rajinder from uh, Karapa, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have one doubt, sir. Sure. Uh, sir. Uh... Yeah. I am not able to hear you. Rajendra. A uh, track will test and we. Yeah, no, well, we came and vanished. So we have to do a track test. Sorry. Can you type it if you want? I am not able to hear you. Rajendra sir, you are not audible. You can use the chat to interact with the Madhav sir. You have to make the foundation stiffer if the tower is or structure is tall. Otherwise, simple bearing capacity will not give you because a lot of differential settlement is possible. And if the differential settlement occurs, there's going to be tilt. And if it tilts, you'll have problem of failure. So you have to increase the stiffness depending on the height of the structure. I was hoping some of you would comment with it. I'm not aware in this software for this. I use only my own. You don't need a big software for this. I can simply use my simple expression and calculate using Excel. Cavity expansion solutions are all available. Please don't depend too much on your software, but use your common sense. To me, that is more important. I find that people use software and they think anything, depth of sample collected is 26 meters. I don't understand. What do you mean? 20? Don't take any sample. It's 26 meters. Try to do a proper in-situ test there. And uh, Nagendra, if you're talking of Kadapa, I think you yes, get a lot of, if it is Kadapa, you will get a lot of stiff weathered soil there. You don't get any soft soil there. Engineering geology is also important. So don't, I mean, I can't believe who got a good sample at 26 meters. Our people yes, cannot even take good sample. Huh? Yes? It was uh, 26 feet, sir. 26 feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but even then, don't collect. Nobody can do a proper sampling. Okay. Most of our so called investigation agencies, they're, I would say, not really qualified. Somebody with a boring machine says he can do, and our you know, industry also is not insisting on quality. So most of the time, the recommendations based on those are very, very poor. Nobody understands the ground, nobody understands the mechanics, and they give some value. Even in Hyderabad, people recommend with hard rock 25, 45 tons per meter square, whereas it can even go up to 100, 125 tons per meter square. This is on one side. There are sites where where there's groundwater flow outside and then 
lot of excavation problems. They don't talk about any of them and give some recommendation. And the industry comes and they say, what do we do? It's nice that I get some good consultancy, but I want better practice of geotechnical engineering. And that is only possible if we show respect to the ground and do a proper testing. Imagine if somebody is sick, he goes to one of these uh, clinical laboratories for blood, blood pressure, whatever it is. And if they don't do a proper investigation and you're diagnosed with something which is not correct, how much one human being suffers? Even the ground is like a human being, you got to investigate properly. So most of our pathological laboratory clinical laboratories, fortunately, we have a good national accreditation body for laboratory. We don't have a similar one. Any fellow who thinks he can, he sets up a geotechnical investigation agency and he gets, because you know, the field people also couldn't care less. Our structural engineer says, give me bearing capacity. If you give him 10 tons, He's happy because his cost of uh, building goes up and his percentage goes up. For all you know, maybe we can take 25 to 30 tons per meter square, but he's happy with 10 because that's good for him. And of course it is very safe. But on the contrary, there are many problems which are unanticipated, which again is possible if you study the ground properly. So, the moral of the lecture is treat ground with respect, investigate with care, and develop a more rational thinking. How is the ground behaving? Should I still believe in Tazagi or should I go for something more recent, more appropriate? Sir, I am Ramakrishna from Vajar. Okay. Basically, I am a mechanical engineer. And this is not for any doubt, but I cannot stop myself praising you. The way you compiled this, you know, in-depth subject in so easy to understand way. It is very nice, sir. And Thank especially you. sharing of, you know, your knowledge and uh, in-depth insights instead of just presenting some subject. I found this is your one of the best civil engineering lectures I had. And it is not like, you know, designed for students. It is designed for, you know, real faculties. Like uh, the way you explain, it is uh, uh, very nice, sir. And, you uh, know, all my 20 years plus I worked in the construction. I found always, you know, common sense supersedes all the technical things. And... It's nice, sir. Uh, I got some, you know, good knowledge today, I can say. Thank you very much, sir. You're most welcome. You made my day. Uh, I'm so, happy. So nice of you, sir. I pray God that he'll give you health, happiness, and we should have more lectures from you. Thank sure, you very sure. much, sir. Anytime. That's, you know, something we all love. I think Professor Reddy knows that anytime I'm in Vishakhapatnam, I give a lecture. I share whatever I have. So nice of you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are um, no, any more questions? I think you have been. So if there are uh, no questions, uh, I thank Professor Ammar Madhav sir for sharing his uh, rich experience with the participants of uh, this faculty development program. So thank you very much, sir, for uh, delivering uh, three lectures, uh, highly informative uh, during this uh, faculty development program. I hope uh, <clears throat> the ideas which you have floated uh, during your uh, presentation will be carried forward by some of the <clears throat> teacher participants who are here as a uh, part of their uh, uh, research problem they can take and carry forward so really 
we should think uh, different from what you, what we have been following uh, based on Tajikis theory. So, so once again, uh, thank you very much, sir, on my own behalf and uh, on uh, department on behalf of the department. Ramkrishna, I think I want to know, Krishna. My email is madhavmr at gmail dot com. I think. Uh, can you note down? Madhav Mr. at gmail.com. Process yes, sir, maybe I, share. I, I am typing in the chat box, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anytime, any of you can contact me. Thank you, Reddy, Professor Reddy. Wish you all the best, everybody. Thank you very much. So, thank uh, all the participants uh, for attending this. Uh, uh, morning session of the FTP. I hope all of you have enjoyed and gained uh, a lot of uh, knowledge right from uh, the presentation of Professor M. R. Madhav sir. So let us meet again uh, in the evening at 3:30 uh, p.m. for uh, the lecture on uh, foundations and expansive oil by Professor Raman Murthy of uh, NIT Varangal. So thank you all. Have a good day.